Hello, welcome to award-winning John White's virtual tours of Scotland and Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. And just and behind the camera, uh, Mike here, and thank you very much for joining us. And you can hear we're right on the button, the clock here. Joe and I are delighted to be back here in Edinburgh to show you some of our favourite spots and sometimes some of the more obscure uh, bits of Edinburgh that you might not have come to if you visited Edinburgh. And I've got this wee map here and first of all I'm going to show you in what area we are actually in. Now we're not far away from Princess Street as you probably know from the sound of that uh, chime on the clock. But to be a bit more exact and I'm uh, going to show you here. Uh, Hopefully you can see Princess Street here, we've got Edinburgh Castle here and uh, we are just in this area here uh, which is uh, not far from the Caledonian Hotel which we'll turn the corner and see shortly and we are going to wander around the corner into the square here and this square is called Rutland Square and it's unusual because it's the most southerly square in Edinburgh's new town because all the squares um, are on the north side of Princess Street, so it's the only one to the south of Princess Street here. So it's quite unusual and it's very beautiful as well, uh, the architecture that we'll see in buildings and the characters we'll talk about too. So, to begin with... And we've got Happy New Year from Japan as well. Oh, Happy New Year to you, thank you very much and all the best to you over in Japan. Uh, we've just got a tram passing at the moment uh, on its way out to the airport. Now we'll just uh, turn the corner and uh, talk about the building here. Uh, building here, uh, many people may just look at the architecture and just uh, think, uh, what's that? <laughs> well, it used to be a church, and if we're going back to the 1840s, uh, one architect, uh, David Cousin, uh, quite a well-known architect in Edinburgh, because he also designed the British Linen Bank uh, office on uh, George Street that we, Joe and I have pointed out before, so he was uh, quite a quirky architect and you can see the style of architecture here and it's what we call Neo-Norman architecture and we know it's Norman because if you look at the arch, uh, if it was Gothic, which a lot of the churches in Edinburgh tend to be more, then it would be pointed, uh, but it, because it's around we know it's off uh, Kind of similar if you've been up to Edinburgh Castle to Queen Margaret's Chapel, if you're familiar with that, which is a very ancient building going back to the 12th century, but this was more or less a later take in that it's 19th century. And it was for what we call the Episcopalian Church, or Church of England, which is not the Church of Scotland. And the Church of England, and Joe and I have spoken about this many times, it is different in that it has bishops and it has a more vertical layer of hierarchy than the Scottish uh, Church, the Church of Scotland, which is a Presbyterian church, which has got a flatter hierarchy, if you know what I mean. Um, so you can enjoy the wonderful sculpture uh, over the doorway here. And They're also, quite grotesque, these little gargoyles, aren't they? They are amazing. And it's always good just sometimes to stop, pause and have a look at the detail, which is easily missed. And there is also a connection here with the, the Knights Templar, the, if you know, like the Da Vinci Code and Roslyn Chapel, Roslyn Chapel to the yeah. south of Edinburgh, where Joe and I take many of our clients on visits. And some of these people are fans of the Da Vinci Code. That's an ancient 15th century chapel. Well, the architect, David Cousin, I am sure, must have been out there to Roslyn Chapel to get inspiration for this amazing uh, doorway here. Now, it was change of use in the 19th century, and it became away from being a church, and into the 20th century, in the 1980s, it became a, a tourist information centre and a heritage centre. Now, in the 1980s, if you went in this door and up the stairs, there was an interactive map of Scotland, and you would uh, perhaps have a family connection, and you would look on the wall and see maybe your name, which was maybe connected to a clan. And today, many of our visitors don't actually know that they have clan connections until Joe and I will say, look, have you checked? 
to see uh, what, where you can connect with a clan. Anyway, you would do that, you would press a button on an interactive map and it would light up some of the areas of Scotland which would be connected to that uh, family name. So that was in the 1980s, but it's gone through other transitions since then. And today it's the Gilly Do. And the Gilly Do in Scots is a male fairy. I think uh, Joe knows a little bit about uh, the background to this. So you've always got to watch with fairies in Scotland, the supernatural. Uh, yeah, they're all part of the Celtic folklore. Yeah. And they're not malevolent, but they are naughty, the little gillies. Uh, so this is the gilly do means the black fairy. Do is yeah, it's the scallop. So do is black, and gilly means little fairy, I believe. And uh, they're not malevolent, but they're naughty. They'll tie your shoelaces together if you upset them. Um, but the, they, they do appear a lot in the Celtic yeah, and, they're, and Gaelic folklore. They're, they're tricky little peoples. In yeah. fact, if you go up there in... They're wee people. They're wee folks. Yeah, if you go up into the highlands of Scotland, sometimes there's uh, villages or towns where there will be massive stones or massive parts of the natural landscape that um, town planners have been fearful to move, even to this day, because they were supposedly the places where the fairies would hide. And if you moved a stone or did something to their lair or their abode, then um, that was very unlucky. And so. they firmly believe this thing still in the Highlands. I mean, you know, you can go to a lot of these places, you can see it's still got the fairy bridges, the fairy pools, the fairy flag up in Dunvegan Castle. So, yeah. That's a big deal. And the Gilly Do is also a venue now today. So it's no longer a tourist information centre, it is a place where you can go to dance, uh, to listen to music, and uh, just as Joe has been saying, like Kayleys, yeah, which Kayleys, yeah. are, are, are gathering events with people coming along, uh, contributing uh, something in the way of music or song or dance, but uh, if you're too lazy, sometimes like me, you'll just sit, have a glass of wine or a pint of beer and just watch the performance. So uh, the Gilly Do, look out for that. And they would normally have burn suppers to celebrate Robert Burns. And uh, I take many groups in here to, to join in with the public, Kayleys, for dancing. They want some Scottish dancing to see what it's all about. It's a good place to come. So again, this is part of the Scottish people re us repurposing. Um, we, don't, we don't let anything go to waste. So no. our churches are, uh, you know, we don't want it to go into rack and ruin. So this, this one we've repurposed. So it's a bar. Uh, it's a dancing place, so it's like salvation and damnation. It goes hand in hand. <laughs> hand in hand, yeah. So we'll walk around the corner. If you remember our little map, we will walk uh, along to this end of Princess Street. We've... Well, this is the view that I love when you come around this corner, Mike, and you get the two churches, the castle in the sunshine. It is exceptionally warm today. Um... It, it is, it is. It's uh, quite unusual for January uh, no. to get to be this warm, in fact. And here's one of our national characters here. This is Urwally. Urwally. Urwally, Urwally, Obadi's Wally. So and this, uh, there were various statues that were painted individually um, and to raise money for charity all around Scotland. Um, and then they were auctioned. And Wally appears every week. So we got what, we've got what we've got little things like words. knock it knee, knock it knee uh, from the sugly hips. Sugly hips there. We've got real Scots Good. coming through yeah. here. We've got a, a leaf at horn, left uh -huh. hand. We've got, we've got gran granny sucres, which like would granny be... Granny sucre jaw, for the Scots will know what that means. That means a granny sucre is a boiled sweetie, which are really hard to crunch. Then you've got a big hert there. So this is your woolly. And we've got next to a cow. And your woolly's always sitting on his bucket, and he's always got a wee mouse called Jimmy. Jimmy. And there's Jimmy, the wee mouse. Yeah. He appears every week in a, a newspaper called the Sunday Post. He's a son of Dundee. But you are, Mike, aren't you? I know, I've got, got big connections with you're, Dundee. You're the Dundonian. The Bruins and Ur Woolley were a very yeah. much a regular read on a Sunday, Absolutely. especially in the newspaper, the Sunday Post. But, uh, He's got a brass neck. He's got tickled ribs. He's got his pooch. And he's got his bucket behind there. We used to call it, what is it, it's what you're trying to get behind? Bahuki, is Bahuki, it? Bahuki, that's the one. Bahuki, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's the anatomy of Urwali. There we go, a little great, character. Great, great. 
Scott's sense of humour, you've always <laughs> got to come across it. And you yeah. got here is again, of course, the Caledonian Hotel, Caledonian. Uh, which originally a railway station hotel here in the late 19th century, but then this big hotel began to develop, which is now known as the Waldorf Astoria. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was also the main railway station for Edinburgh originally. Uh, before Waverley Station on the more eastern side, all the trains would come in here and you would get your Hollywood movie stars, people like David Niven, Marlena Dietrich, Charlie Chaplin, Fred Astaire, Ginger Roy Rogers, Rogers, all of them, and Roy Trigger. Rogers and Trigger, yeah. <laughs> and Trigger. Beautiful. <laughs> Opened in uh, 1903. Yeah. So here we've got the Rutland Hotel, which is uh, coming down here, Rutland Street, uh, opposite the Caledonian Hotel, and you can see shades of this church again as we move further over here in the back of the Gilly Do. So the Rutland Hotel is like a boutique hotel, it's a small hotel, and occasionally pick people up from here. Um, the Caledonian on the other side, of course, is a five-star luxury hotel, and uh, it's got suites and all sorts of uh, great things, like Peacock Alley is a big open area where you can go and have your coffee or afternoon tea. And, and that, is the, that was the waiting room of the train station. It the, was, the, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The lovely alley, the lovely peacock alley in there. So you now have got this other side of um, the St Thomas's Church, which was the one we were talking about earlier. We saw the other side of it. So you've got um, it kind of was changed a bit in the 19th century to in the later 19th century after the initial build, so that it would tone in a bit more with the domestic architecture with the more secular architecture coming down here so it didn't like stand out like a sore thumb so it blended in quite nicely and uh, here we've got uh, a connection to another character who we, we talk about quite a lot uh, is Lord Lister now Joseph Lister he wasn't Scottish he came from down south he came to Edinburgh because he knew that uh, the reputation of Edinburgh with its fine medical school and one uh, professor, James Syme, who was professor of surgery, was somebody that he wanted to hook up with. And uh, it was a time of great infections. And Joe will know a bit more about this because microorganisms and the way wounds would be infected, uh, they didn't really understand fully these organisms that we know today and things like COVID and all that. But when somebody had an accident, like there was an occasion when a boy, young boy, uh, had a, an accident with a cart. I think he fell off the cart and the cart partially went over him. And uh, the patella in his, would it be which part of his anatomy, Joe, would that be? That's his, the knee. It's the knee, yes. <laughs> I know all about patellas. <laughs> Mine had to be readjusted and reattached. And it was fractured. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, Like me? Normally what would happen would be it would get hugely infected because they didn't know too much about that. They would sort the wound as best they could. But then Joseph Worcester knew uh, if he used what was called carbolic and he used wire, silver wire, that he soaked in carbolic and uh, that was wound around the patella to sort it and the boy was cured. And Joseph Worcester's reputation spread hugely. He is known as being the leading person in antiseptic surgery, as you can see here today, and also Queen Victoria. And I believe she had a growth like uh, under her arm and uh, Joseph Worcester was called upon to sort it out because it was hugely infected and uh, he cured this. Uh, it was a non-malignant thing uh, uh, that had grown <laughs> under her arm and uh, she was just so amazed by this that he healed this that uh, he was ahead of his time. So he lived here, uh, Lord Worcester. What we have to bear in mind is the yeah. advancement of science and medicine in Edinburgh at that time. And I know I've mentioned these books before, but written by a collaboration of Christopher Brookmeyer and his wife. Yeah. I think it's called The Way of the Flesh. Um, I think it's called that, but <clears throat> it's all about um, Edinburgh Gothic. And it's all about the story. The story is based around James Simpson and uh, Anesthesia. Yeah, at the same yeah. time, we've got Joseph Lister. This place was 
hoaching with new ideas. That's, oh, a, yeah. that's a good Scottish word, hoaching with new oh, ideas. for sure. Uh, yeah. And they all live close to each other. And they, they all worked at the same hospital together. And they were all developing uh, with each other. So the Royal Academy of Sciences here in Edinburgh was the place to be. And you already mentioned Victoria. Victoria was the first monarch to give birth under anaesthesia. anaesthesia. Yeah. So I'm going yeah. to give a big thanks to Joseph Lister and myself and to James Simpson because I also had a major operation, which I've now getting a lot better with it. And I want to thank these two guys. Yeah, the techniques they used then um, were the lead into modern medicine and how we uh, get things treated today. So a huge figure. Yeah. Um, he uh, took over uh, James Symes role as a professor of surgery at Edinburgh, then he moved uh, down to Oxford. So he's highly lauded mm. in uh, not just in medicine, but in the history of Edinburgh and the general history of the United Kingdom as well. Such a huge influential. And character. everybody will know Listerine. Listerine mouthwash, <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> now we're going to uh, talk about another character. Uh, as we walk down here, because uh, medicine was huge, employed many people, and uh, like the law did in Edinburgh too, which was a centre of uh, legal studies, and many of the houses, even down here, if you pass them, they'll say such and such advocate where you can go uh, to, to for any legal matter that you might think about. And so. the writers to the signet, so you do see their names, they always like to put their title on their um, nameplates at the door, you know. Like WS. WS, yeah, writers yeah, to the signet. Yeah. So we're walking a little bit down, if you see the architecture here, uh, this was a very important um, uh, end, if you like, to the western part of Edinburgh's uh, new town. It, it, the, the houses here are very elegant and, and, and fine architects were brought in actually to to design them. You can see the beautiful balconies also up the top here as well. And it's fair to say, Mike, that the Rutland Square is still full of legal firms. Oh yes. Yeah, lots of and, and property and legal firms. For sure, yeah, yeah. We can swing around a little bit and we can see this archway which is opposite stick we're walking down and uh, this gives you an idea of the Caledonian railway station because the big arches were the original entrances into the platforms of the station so you could just imagine the steam trains piling in here there would be a big goods yard here there would be big heaps of coal of course the fire the steam engines and uh, it would just be a hugely industrious smoky and I think uh, that's one reason we don't want to live, or would like to live back in these days, because there'll be a huge amount of smoke, not just from the coal firm, uh, fires of the houses, but also from the steam trains that would be leaving. And there'd from be big the coal station. yards here as well, where they had to load up. That's right, it'd absolutely. Be very noisy places. I'm going to take us to a little hidden corner here, because this is possibly somebody that you haven't actually heard of, not this one anyway. Um, John Brown, and maybe when we say John Brown, you're maybe more uh, aware of Queen Victoria's uh, manservant, the kilted John, John Brown, but it's not that one, it's a Dr. John Brown. Now, he was a medical doctor, and uh, going back to the 19th century, and you can see this uh, little plaque here, and it was his son who loved his father so much that he decided to memorialise his father. Now, Syme, he came from a place called Bigger in the Scottish Borders and he came up to Edinburgh of course as well to study and be apprentice to Professor James Syme who we were talking about earlier with the connection with Lord Lister. But also he, in addition to his medical studies, was an essayist. He was a writer and that is not terribly unusual because if you think of Arthur Conan Doyle mm -hmm. who was also medically trained and qualified who wrote books. Well, this chap here, John Brown, he also fancied himself as a bit of an author. And he had a couple of very influential friends. One was Mark Twain, and the other one was uh, William Makepeace Thackeray, exactly. who, of course, uh, wrote Vanity That's Fair. Good connection so he had very good connections. And he decided he was going to write a book. And this book was called, and we can see it on the inscription, 
Rab and his friends. And Rab was a dog. He was a grey, huge grey mastiff dog. And uh, if you read the story, which you can see online, I believe, as, as well, it's on the Gutenberg site, and you can freely download it or read it. It tells you about being set in Edinburgh where these two young boys, one of them being John Brown and his friend, came across a dog fight where um, this little bull terrier was attacking uh, this, I think it was an Alsatian dog or a farm dog, quite a big dog, up at the Tron in the old town of Edinburgh and they were going at it like mad and this little uh, dog being a terrier and uh, very ferocious almost killed the bigger dog until uh, a crowd gathered and pulled the little bull terrier away. Well, the bull terrier went down to the cow gate and he met Rab. And Rab was the dog who is the subject of the story. And the bull terrier made to attack Rab. And Rab just stood there because he had a muzzle, a leather muzzle on. And uh, John Brown, he had a knife, or he got a knife from a nearby cobbler who happened to just come out of his shop and was watching this happen. He took the knife, he cut the muzzle off the big dog, and the big dog uh, killed the bull terrier. Now, the story goes on and follows the life of this rab, the dog, who was the dog belonging to a carter, a carrier, a person who transported goods. And sadly, this carter, his uh, wife, uh, became ill with breast cancer. And we've got a description of the story of the wife being taken in for medical attention to uh, Dr. Brown, who then passes on uh, treatment to the surgeon, who we, a good idea, it was James Syme, although the name doesn't say James Syme. And it takes place where the, the breast um, and the growth in the breast has got to be removed and this takes place at Edinburgh Medical School in front of all the students so you get a description of all this the dog Arab is watching it all so all the emotions and story of human beings get filtered into the animal the animal is very aware and very sad and finally the lady dies the dog uh, follows the funeral it's a bit like uh, Greyfriars Bobby okay, great. <laughs> to finish off here the, the dog um, was spotted years later by Dr. Brown with another owner. Or rather, the dog wasn't spotted. He, the owner uh, had the horse which belonged to the previous owner who had the dog. The, dog was, the, the horse was called Jess. So I get a wee bit mixed up here, but I think I've recovered, I've recovered. Stick with it, stick with it. It's a wee help. Dr Brown, he said, um, sorry, it said, where's Rab? I don't see Rab there. And the new guy, he said, well, you know, I bought this horse, Jess, and Rab would not let me near Jess, to feed Jess and look after Jess the horse. So I had to kill the dog. Oh. I know. So the dog I'm, I'm already. died, <laughs> and that was it. Now, there must have been some... Uh, Dr Brown had prided himself in being very much up in dog behaviour and how dogs would connect to events in the lives of human beings. So I think there is a lot of um, human emotion. Anthrop and anthropomorphism. You've got it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rab and his friends. There we go. Written by Dr. John Brown. A there cheery you know. story. A cheery and this, story. Be, and this looks like it's one of the few private residences still left here. It looks like a private residence rather than an office. Yeah, some really. of these places, I mean, yeah. are, um, are quite palatial. Yeah. And you probably will get uh, medical people high up in the university, perhaps as well. Uh, educators, educationalists, professors. Uh, lawyers staying down in this area here. But what I'd like us to look at is up to the left and the right there. Now you see these uh, capitals, which are the fancy bits at the top of the pillars. These are called Corinthian capitals, and they're very fancy. And this part of town uh, was thought or was planned to echo the amazing approach to Edinburgh from the east 
and the leading architect who designed the approach to Edinburgh along Waterloo Place was called Archibald Elliot and it's his plans that had this very dramatic uh, opening into the square, into Rutland Square, as you can see on either side there. So it's very symmetrical on either side and there. it does look like a movie set, doesn't it? I mean, you can just imagine the carriages pulling up and filming a costume drama here in Rutland Square. Yeah, oh, it'd be so easy to take you back in time here because yeah. it's... Uh, and they still have the old-fashioned uh, streetlights. They don't have the big street lights like we have in the rest of the city. They've got like the old-fashioned gas lamps, still fashioned in the city. Although they are electric, they are styled. And we'll show you a couple of them in a minute. Yeah, no, it, it's beautiful. It's absolutely amazing architecture. And it's very human architecture. Uh, the maximum height of these buildings is three storeys, although they have a basement. So it's very much in human proportion. Uh, we can the lights here, and also they've got the old boot scraper. There we go, yeah, just there. Yep, so this is be making sure you didn't trail in all the muck and all the ordure, because there'd be That's lots right. of that around right. in the uh, mid-1800s onwards. So you would be taking some... your horse and carriage, you'd have muddy boots, and you, mm -hmm. wouldn't, you would want to get them all clean before you went into your nice carpeted house. And uh, we have got here, these capitals, as we see here, are uh, called Ionic. Uh, it's one of the, what we call the orders of architecture. We've already talked about the Corinthian ones, which are the very, very fancy Grecian ones. Well, we've got these curly ones, which are Ionic here. And the thing about Rutland Square, that's what this is called, Rutland Square, is that all the porticos, which are the entrances, have the same pillars mm -hmm. and uh, these ionic tops to them. So and we've got the Doric, Ionic and Corinthian. Corinthian, that's right. Now, if you look also, uh, Edinburgh is well known for its cast iron work. And you can see that up in the balconies at the top here. And I think these are, are very amazing as well. These are all original. Some of the railings in the new town, further over or further north from here, have been replaced. But this is all original. It's all part of the same thing to tie in with the design of the buildings here. They look pretty lethal, don't they? They do. A lot of them were lost during the war, I believe, because they were taken into uh, for, for munitions. That's right. Um, met or for metal shortages. Yeah, yeah the, this is what we call a canthus leaf. Mm -hmm. If you look closely enough, you could see the, the little divisions in the veins of the leaves. It's very subtle there. And of course we've got, I think this could be a pineapple, pineapple. which yeah. would be a symbol of welcome, I think, normally. And we talked about the pineapple, of course, when we went to... Joe, you gave your surprise too, remember? The big pineapple. And the pineapple, yeah, the yeah. pineapple itself. The pi yeah. So we've got here... Uh, come up to it now is the Scottish Arts Club. Are you uh, a member of this, Mike? I'm not, but you know, I could become a member of it. And it's uh, described as the friendliest club in Edinburgh. There's all these clubs yeah, and the many people are club people. And so, I, I'm sure if I went into this club, I would probably recognise some people who go into another club mm. here in the city. And clubs are great because they're nice places to relax, nice interiors. You can go in here and you can take a workshop in painting. You can uh, go in here and get a music workshop, all sorts of things, literature too. And uh, it's the arts, not just art as we think of it as being painting, but would also be uh, painting, literature, music. And this was founded, one of the founders of this in 1870, this was a fellow that we talk about quite a lot who was a sculptor who sculpted Alexander and Persepolis up at the uh, city chambers on the Royal Mile. And he was one of the founder members of this place today. Now, there's lots of different people who have been members, past members too. Uh, Sir Compton Mackenzie, mm -hmm. if you're familiar with him, another writer who wrote Whiskey Galore, Whiskey Galore and many other famous books too. He was a member here as well. And current members include Alexander McCall Smith with the Scotland Street novels, but also Ian Rankin, 
is a current member here as well of the Scottish Arts Club. So what you do, you go onto the website, you pay your money, and that's you in. And you can just go in there, you can sit in your comfy chair, read the newspaper, whatever, write a letter. You just relax in your mind. And you can stalk your favourite author. You can stalk your favourite <laughs> author. It's a good networking opportunity yeah. as well. I feel Val McDermott will be in She's <laughs> one of my favourite authors at the moment, Val McDermott. But I've got to say one thing, which uh, we always say it all, uh, that it was male-only club. And it only became admissible to female members in the 1980s. 1980s. So is that not a disgrace? <laughs> From the 1870s, it was only men who could actually be members of a club. And I don't know if you've seen, Joe, uh, the mini-series of Around the World in 80 Days. Yeah, I haven't watched it. I've got it in catch up. It's great. It was a great series. Well, the, it highlights the club there and all the men sitting and uh, the place full of smoke, cigarette mm. smoke, reading the newspapers. This woman comes in. And they're absolutely horrified. <laughs> Why is she doing there? You, she had to be escorted out. So, but anyway. Oh. That's that very common. I mean, you have golf yeah. clubs that only allow yeah. women in very recently, only under threat of yeah. them having some of the championships being removed from them. So, yeah. you know. So, yeah, just... so today, and we've even had a, a woman president of uh, the Scottish Arts Club, even. Why should I say even? Oh. That would just be normal. So, um, again, wonderful building amazing architecture here and uh, I'm kind of like Groucho Marx I would never join a club that would let me be a member of <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one I uh, must remember that one <laughs> I would only join clubs that would throw me out <laughs> now some of the Edinburghers are Scots who used to visit Edinburgh going back maybe to the 1960s and uh, looking at the darkness to the stone here this may bring back memories because almost every building in Edinburgh was this colour. Yeah. Because a combination of coal fires burning smoke, but also too, it was the natural way of the stone with exposure to daylight would actually begin to discolour and turn this blackened way. So, but you can see some of them are a bit cleaner than others. Some of them have been cleaned up a bit. Yeah. Yeah, and there's uh, an apartment for sale, so there are some private apartments still here in the square as well. Oh yes, yes. You find them to be quite expensive, yeah. uh, probably to get a residence in this part of town. It's probably going to, I don't know, maybe it's at least a million. Oh, I think about 1.3, 1.4. Several 1. million, yeah. yeah, yeah, I would think so, yeah. I mean, a couple of years back a friend of mine bought a townhouse for about yeah. 7 million. And then divided it up into apartments, yeah, sold them yeah. about 1.4, 1.5 each. So this is expensive. It's I mean, crazy. Uh, you're right in the centre of yeah, town. It's absolutely amazing. So we are coming across the street here, and we're still on that one square. And you can see what the buildings are like when they're cleaned up a bit, you know, with the sandstone. Because the sandstone itself um, was kind of oily and used to absorb the, yes. the pollution. That's right, that's right, yeah. So we have. Uh, got an architect who I don't really hear an awful lot about who uh, was the designer of most of the buildings in the square and he's called John Tate and uh, as we walk further down uh, some of these houses these were probably well we know for sure they were townhouses of some of the most important figures of the 19th century uh, politicians as well celebrities of that time and of course the legal profession and you name it but uh, today again repurposed into offices some of them you can see here asset management but here is the consulate general of india and uh, this is a very palatial building here Incre incredible and again it's very much in the same architecture it's got the ionic columns at the top but this was built to impress for sure and if we go further back you will see that John Tate was uh, really designing what we have already seen and that Joe and I have talked about quite a lot in Charlotte Square is what we call the palace front where these are individual houses but you would get the feeling 
and uh, you would be able to communicate that you were maybe staying in a palace, although you weren't, although you didn't have the whole thing, but uh, it gave that impression in some ways, the visuals here. Most amazing it is. Yep, money talks, didn't it? It certainly does, <laughs> it's for certainly sure. shouted here in Edinburgh, that's for sure. Yeah, money was shouting in those days. And I believe, uh, too, Joe, I don't know if you had sampled it, but there's a Rutland Square gin, apparently. There is a gin distillery in this area, which has got, um, I think it's an Indian uh, group who actually own it. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the botanicals have got connections with India. So it's no coincidence that we've got the Indian consulate just behind us here. Yeah, I think it's actually distilled further down in Dumfries and Galloway, is it not? I think it's, but it's called Rutland. It's the Rutland, yeah. Rutland Square Gin. Yeah. So it may be something to do, do with, with the, the fact Indian that the consulate. consulate. And just to clear up for our international viewers, uh, we cannot have embassies here in Scotland because we are not a sovereign nation. We are a nation and we're a country, but we are under the umbrella of what's called the United Kingdom and we have a devolved uh, administration. Uh, so embassies are in London mainly. But then again, having said that, you can make passport applications and various visa applications here anyway. So it's a bit of a, like a branch office, if you like, of an embassy. Yeah, we've London. got lots of consulates up here in Edinburgh. Yeah, yeah. So we're coming to this amazing building next door, and this has got quite a historical connection. I wonder, in that. Any, I wonder if we have any architects who are actually viewing or were architects, because this is a... Yeah, this is the Royal Institute of Architects in Scotland. And would you believe this happened to be someone's house at one point, uh, a gentleman called uh, Robert Rowan Anderson, and uh, he lived here. And uh, we're going and to back to the I'm kind of 1830s up to the early 20th century when Rowan Anderson was around. I'm going to take a wee sneak, sneak peek. A sneak look, and there is a bust, a uh, sculpture of Robert Rowan Anderson there at the bottom of the stair. Rowan Anderson, uh, he, we, we're always talking about him because he designed so many buildings including the McEwen Hall at uh, Edinburgh University. He also designed the Scottish National Portrait Gallery and uh, he had a hand in many, many buildings. In fact, uh, at Glasgow Central Station, mm -hmm. uh, he was the architect for that as well. So he was the first um, chairperson, if you like, of uh, this, this organisation, uh, founder and first president, I should say. Now, a good thing, and being a painter that I like about this, and architects would study at art college, and when we did drawing classes at art college in Dundee, the School of Architecture would send its students to do a life drawing. Now here, every president of this Institute of Architects has the right to have an artist of their choice paint the portrait. And it's got an amazing collection of portraits in here by some of the great, famous, portrait painters and the head of my school of painting at art college was a man called Alberto Morocco. Well, he's a great portrait painter. There are some of his in here. There's also Alexander Gaudi from Glasgow as well and Jack Knox. And these are some of the artists who uh, had the privilege of painting the portraits of the presidents of this organisation. Now it's got a bookstore and uh, visitors can go in here. But what I do like in the main room, like the conference room, first story up above the portico, there was a great table which happened to be Rowan Anderson's dining table. And a lot of the bookcases and collections are still uh, pers well, property of Rowan Anderson, Robert Rowan Anderson. These buildings have got so much secret, so many secrets and so many stories. In here, I want us to have a look at this plaque because I think this is uh, quite important. It's the Royal Society for the Relief of mm. Indigent Gentlewomen of Scotland. Now, I think this is uh, quite, quite an important thing. It was quite a forward-looking uh, 
idea at the time because this uh, took shape in the 1870s and uh, it is not to forget of the women maybe from whatever class or from whatever profession or not necessarily profession but in later life who may just uh, lead a very poverty stricken lifestyle or maybe have done all their lives and today it is a charity where people in need can apply. It still exists today and the president of this charity is the Queen uh, who takes a, a keen interest in this charity. So all these organisations, you know, that some of us don't know about, mm. but again say that this is an enlightened city, it cares for its people. And uh, we're passing further along here and you can see more of the, this amazing architecture. And once again, you've and still got the same inside. iron mongery there too. And this is the Norwegian consulate. Close relationship between Scotland and Norway, especially after the Second World War, <clears throat> when a lot of the Norwegians came over here and formed units to yeah, help fight yeah. for the liberation of, uh, of Norway and uh, every year people of Norway give Edinburgh and London a Christmas tree. Yes. And uh, we also have the big rock which was given Down to us by the Norwegians to say thank you for putting up with our men and women who yeah. fought against the occupation of Germany. Well originally the Christmas tree so was... the occupation of, of Norway. Yeah, the, originally the Christmas tree uh, was uh, cut down in Norway and sent over to Scotland, but they don't do that anymore, but they actually pay for one. Mm -hmm. They support it still today, which is a nice thought. Uh, of course we also get that Norway is a monarchy as well, so this is the Royal Norwegian General Consulate. Absolutely. And this area here today is uh, not hugely visited. It's, it's quite a quiet oh. square. And some people, even in Edinburgh, don't know if it's existence or maybe haven't even come here. A few uh, people use that as a rat run because you can get to places very quickly. Yeah. Um, if you want to look over there, uh, Joe, um, we're just going to look over the bridge and we're, we're heading for the business quarter. I think we'll call it the exchange area. But if you look further over, you can see an electrical substation. And uh, that has been painted up. So it gives the impression, it's maybe seen better times of being a bit of an art installation, although mm. it isn't. And uh, it is Dewar Place, which uh, was the main electricity substation. And traditionally, it was a place where resources for power were kept before electricity took off. Uh, it was coal and there was huge storage yards in that area for coal, big mounds of coal. And uh, going back to the 1960s, I can vaguely remember um, seeing where the coal person would go to get your coal for your domestic purposes, but it was also close enough to the station to be very handy. Oh. But no coal there today. Yep. It's an ele electrical substation. And your place, which is just off Tarfikin Street, the facade has been protected. Where it used to be an ancient, like, uh, early 20th century uh, building, brick building, but they've taken out the whole of the ba back of it and preserved the frontage. Uh, which is still there today. And yeah. Talking about the architecture, going back to it, on Rutland Square we were looking at three, maybe four storey buildings, but Edinburgh is quite deceptive because all you do is turn the corner and look, the buildings go down another two or three floors. So, again, it's this um, idea that Edinburgh uses the hills and uses the space, you know. It's, it, just, it's incredible. Not everything is what you see from, from first sight. But the front of the building, four or five storeys high, back of the building goes down two or three more. And so we yeah. get some lovely apartments. You can see where things have been repurposed as well, Joe. You know, look at that wall down there and all the little wall areas sticking out from it. Yeah, I'm sure that that's been something 
older than a car park, which is, uh, they've used bits and pieces of older building and architecture. It's quite fascinating to and look this, at. This would have been the servants' entrance, of course. Oh yeah, for sure, yeah, yeah that's right. Now we're gonna finish off at this one here, which is a sculpture, uh, and it is very similar to another sculpture that we've covered in an earlier tour. Once again, if you want to catch up, remember John Mike's uh, virtual tours on YouTube. It's there off Stockbridge. We went down to Silver Mills and saw a, an equestrian sculpture by the same sculptor. And this one is called Horse and the Rider. And it's by Ian Bridge. And uh, he was born in Edinburgh in the uh, early 1960s. A uh, very successful sculptor, won many awards and also was commissioned to do uh, wall sculptures for the P&O cruise ship line. So if any of you have been on cruises, you may have seen some of his artwork on, on the, the walls and the lounges there. But if you look at this one here, it has a parallel with uh, the tra great tradition of human beings and horses all through art history and that is what he is commenting on. He's saying, you know, this is such a popular image and uh, Joe reminded me before we started the tour that we'd already talked about Alexander and Bucephalus. Uh, once again it's taken that image and played around with it and in addition there is very much abstract qualities to it, to the general shape that you can actually see. Now the story about one the steel is about the, the pig's ear. Yeah. Have a look at the ears on this one, Mike. Well, there you they're, go. They're very, it looks like it is a, a nod and a wink to steel. I think so. Because those the ears are way out of proportion. I think, I think there's certainly a parallel there. And if you look at the stylized eye there, um, it's just summed up the image in a few just simple uh, shapes. Uh, which is the mark of a really successful sculpture and you can enjoy the open space round about it. You can see the mark of the human hand, which would have been originally a clay model. You can see the mark of the tools in the tooling of the, the surface of this as well. So it's got lots of things in it. If you pause a moment, you can see the ribs of the horse on this side as well. Uh, coming out in its amazing texture there. It's a very powerful image. So, I don't know, have you ever been to Oslo? Uh, I have, yes, yes. You remember the bridge in Oslo with all the statues of the development of man and, um, on, right along the bridge? Vaguely, I remember quite, that, yeah. Is it coincidental we have this, which is very similar to the Norwegian things outside the Norwegian embassy of Consulate? Well, that, that's right. And also we've got lots of financial institutions around here as well who will uh, sponsor Mm -hmm. artworks. In fact many of these offices will have examples of sculpture and paintings in them and I think this one is maybe is by Bailey Gifford. Bailey Gifford, which is a financial company. Asset management company. Asset management, yeah. Yep. So I think we're just coming <laughs> to the end of the tour today and uh, a quite a fitting point I think. A lovely sunset on the... In fact what we could do, we could walk up a wee bit because we've got, got a view from the bridge. The uh, how, how are you? Your leg, how's your leg, George? My okay? leg is fine. I've been walking two or three miles every day. I've been on different terrains. I've been down yeah. at the beach. Yeah. I've been um, walking down cliff, um, cliff paths. I've yeah. been up in the Pentland Hills, um, uh, work, uh, up at the, the reservoirs. So I'm working in different terrains. I'm at the back at the gym tomorrow. I've got Fantastic. a whole slew of exercises that my physiotherapist has given me. So I'll be doing that. You put me to shame. I need to do a bit of that. I'll be on the bike. I'm <laughs> running on the walking machines. I'm not running yet, but I'm walking. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I'm walking with that stick. Lovely sunset. I thought this was a good place to start the tour, to finish the tour, because uh, here's our old favourite Edinburgh Castle, and this is called the Western Approach Road, and uh, this used to be the way that the trains would come in. Uh, from the west, from Glasgow and so on, uh, but no more. And you can see on either side this balance of modern architecture. We call this the exchange area, and on the left is uh, Standard Life Insurance Company. And um, on this side, 
I think this is, is Bank of Scotland or something like, like that. Clydesdale. Clydesdale Bank on that side, on the right hand side there. So then you can see the castle, the barracks castle, that, uh, sorry, the barracks part, which Walter Scott absolutely hated. He said it looked like a vulgar cotton mill. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so Edinburgh coming back. Wow. We are getting back a bit more. Um, and hopefully in the next few weeks things will improve a bit more mm -hmm. and uh, our hospitality is open to a certain extent although we don't have the full opening as yet but we're hoping to get there. So I'd like to just uh, stop here and thank you very much for joining.